In our second session on 1 Thessalonians 4, 9-12, we focus not this time on brotherly love, that is, behavior towards brothers throughout all Macedonia, but rather Paul's very earnest concern about how the way the Thessalonians are behaving will affect unbelievers, those who are outside the church. Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves are God-taught to love one another. For that indeed is what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more, and then he urges them to do something with regard to the outsiders, and to aspire to live quietly, and to mind your own affairs, and to work with your own hands as we instructed you, so that, here's the goal of the quietness, working, minding your own affairs and working with your own hands, the goal is so that you may walk properly toward outsiders and have no need of anything, have need of nothing. Father, I pray that we would get guidance, God taught guidance for our own relating to unbelievers as we ponder Paul's words here in Jesus' name. Amen. Just a word here about aspire, an unusual word. It means to have an ambition. Paul used it here in Romans 15 where he said, From Jerusalem and all the way around to Illyricum, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ and I make it my ambition. That's the same word. I make it my ambition to preach the gospel not where Christ has already been named. So I just I want to underline here that it is right and good for Christians to have aspirations or ambitions. We should not be a lackadaisical people just drifting through life with no Bible-saturated God taught goals, plans, aspirations. So he exhorts them to aspire. He urges them to aspire to live quietly, mind their affairs, work with their own hands, as he instructed them. We'll come back to those three in just a moment. So that you may walk properly. And that word properly there is a very general word for what not only believers, but unbelievers in general regard as proper behavior, like working for a living. That's the idea. Don't, don't unnecessarily take up patterns of behavior, which even the world and not only Christians regard as unseemly or untoward or inappropriate or improper. You have that kind of language in New Testament ethics, which doesn't deal directly with right and wrong, but with what's proper and improper, helpful and unhelpful, offensive and not offensive. And that's the idea here. So don't walk in a, a, an improper way, but rather properly toward outsiders. He's very concerned here with outsiders. Now, what's the problem? What what is he getting at here? This is very soft. There's no hard criticism here. This is going to become a criticism in Second Thessalonians. It's already creeping into the church, this meddling with other people's affairs, this failing to do the work that you ought to do so that you are not in need of anything, but supporting yourself. What's going on here? We see a hint of it here in 1 Thessalonians 5, 14. We urge you, brothers, admonish the idle. There they are. So they are already there when he writes the first letter. The idle. Something is going on. Sometimes it is suggested that they're misunderstanding the timing of the second coming so that they're quitting their jobs because they think the 
day of the Lord is going to happen any day, and so they don't need to work anymore. So there are these idle people. Then when you get to 2 Thessalonians, here in chapter 3, look what it says. Now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who's walking in idleness. This is more serious, isn't it? And not in accord with the tradition that you receive from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us because we were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's bread. In other words, we weren't dependent on others like we saw back here. Don't have need of anything. Work with your own hands. Support yourself. We did that. We showed you how to do that. Nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with toil and labor, we worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. So he was giving them an example that work is good, work is right, work is Christian. Verse 10, for even when we were with you, we would, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. Whoa, we'll deal with that when we get there. But that's a strong warning. For we hear that some among you are walking in idleness. Okay, here it is again. They were already there in 1 Thessalonians, and now here they are, and he's having to really get tough because they are bringing a lot of reproach from the outsiders. Some among you are walking in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. They're meddlers. They're getting involved in other people's affairs. They're mooching off other people. This is bringing reproach from the community. Now, such persons we command and encourage in the Lord. Uh, Jesus Christ, to do their work quietly, to earn their own living, which brings us back now to don't have need of anything. Work with your own hands. Mind your own affairs. So that's what's going on here. There's, there's evidently a movement in the church of quitting their jobs or thinking that for some misunderstanding of the second coming or some misunderstanding of love. You could just do nothing and mooch off of other people. And Paul says, no, that's not the way to live properly before outsiders. That, that phrase, I, I put the Greek here just so you could even see it with your own eyes, that this very phrase, before outsiders, is used one other place here, namely in Colossians, where Paul says, walk in wisdom toward Outsiders, that's the phrase, toward outsiders, exactly the same phrase. Making the best use of the time, let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer each person. So wisdom is called for here. This is not proper. He's not using the language of proper, improper. He's using the language now of wise and foolish and best use of the time and graciousness and language that's seasoned with salt, keen to answer every person. So there is a way to relate to outsiders in an evangelistic way that tells the truth about the gospel, but it involves a great deal of discernment and wisdom, and they're not having it, <laughs> right? They're not minding their own affairs, but becoming busybodies. There's an interesting reference in First Peter to that idea of meddling or busybodies. He says in um, 1 Peter 4, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings that you may rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If any are insulted for the name of Christ, you're blessed, but because the Spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, well, that's obvious, or a thief, yeah, that's obvious, or an evildoer, right? Or, this is the idea, meddler, busybody, doing nothing, sticking your nose in where it doesn't belong, not making your own living, but intruding your life into other people's lives where it doesn't belong. Don't suffer for that. If you suffer as a Christian, that's going to happen. But don't 
suffer where you don't need to suffer by failing to mind your own affairs, failing to work with your own hands. And that's what's meant by quietly. We might stumble over that word quietly. I do. I wonder, just what do you mean by that, Paul? Because you have said that we should speak the gospel. It's so plain that we are to let people know that we're Christians. So quietness doesn't mean you don't say anything. What does quiet mean? Well, the least it means here is you don't become um, a noisy busybody messing around in other people's lives when you ought to be quietly doing your own work. That's the main thrust of quiet. So go to work, have your shop. And I think the reason it says with your hands here is not because there's anything wrong with making a living by doing service kinds of work or mental kinds of work, but that in the first century, hardly anybody had that privilege. If you're going to make a living and be in need of nothing, you're almost certainly going to be using your hands. So quietly have your shop, do do whatever it takes with your own hands to quietly make your own living so you're not dependent on other people minding your own affairs. That's the general thrust. But I can't help but also implied here is, here's another pointer that makes me think this. Here's 1 Timothy 2. First of all, then I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, thanksgivings, be made for all people, for kings, and for all who are in high positions. And here's what you pray, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet, same idea, same word, quiet life, godly, dignified in every way. In other words, Christians are not out to be noisy, self-exalting, offensive. We aim, and I'll close with this, as one possible meaning for quiet. Matthew 6, Jesus says, when you give to the needy, which of course Christians were known for doing and ought to do, sound no trumpet. So that's quiet, right? Sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets that they may be praised. And so make some noise so that they know you're there. No. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. That means that if you have a right handed and you reach into your bag and get some money and put it into the hand of a, a needy person, you should do it so quietly that your left hand doesn't even know you've done it. That's the idea so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who who sees in secret will reward you. Now, I'm just suggesting here that the ordinary Christian life is a life of steady state working with our hands, steady state minding our own business, steady state being in need of nothing, so that quietly we are putting no offense, nothing improper in the way of outsiders, and then our witness and our service just quietly makes its way, and good deeds of that sort cannot be hidden, and words of testimony out of this kind of life are going to have a great impact.